Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Taito Tech 500 webinar. Or if you're listening to the Taito podcast, thank you for tuning in to this new episode. If you're here, you've probably heard of the fifth edition of Taito's Tech 500 Power List, a ranking of the most influential individuals in European tech. It is the first data-driven ranking that doesn't rely on single metrics of subjective opinion, and we're here to learn more about it today. We will also discuss what creates influence and the impact of COVID-19 on this impressive power list, and of course, what this means for us in tech and communications in the United States. My name is Sabrina Horn. I'm the CEO of Horn Strategy and author of Make It, don't fake it, leading with authenticity for real business success. I'm delighted to be joined today by three Tech 500 experts, UK's Zoe Clark, head of media and influence at Taito, Germany's Silke Rossmann, head of practice, and France's representative, Shamina Pirbakis, a senior consultant at Taito. They will guide us through the Taito Tech 500 findings and show us why this ranking is so important and how it is relevant to us in tech and comms in the US. One of Taito's aims with the Tech 500 is to help US companies entering Europe understand the tech landscape in the region. I have been working in tech for many, many years now, and I'm excited to host this discussion and analyze the importance of influence in today's technology world. Please remember that you can listen to the Taito podcast in your preferred podcast app or watch the recording in the Taito PR YouTube channel if you're not here already. So with that, over to you, Zoe, to know more about the Taito Tech 500 Power List. Hi everyone, and thank you so much, Sabrina. That's that's a great intro there. Yeah, so let me tell you a little bit more about the ranking that we've created. So I think the best thing to say is that uh, when we really started creating this Tech 500 Power List back in 2017, our aim really was to identify the most influential people within the tech sector in the UK. And also, like you say, to really try and understand and shine a bit of a light on what is influence, what, what drives influence, what creates it. And yeah, the ranking has certainly grown since we started it in 2017. As you mentioned, we use a very deliberate uh, methodology based on a really objective assessment. And we have indeed be able, been able to chart those kind of top 500 in the UK for five years now, and in Germany for three years. And we, we very successfully added France to our report last year. Um, and we started by focusing on the top 100 influencers there. But this year, we're proud to say that we have um, been able to build on that. And we have expanded that French list to an analysis of the top 500 there as well. So matching the other two countries. So now we now have a, a nicely well-rounded um, European list and individual rankings for each country. And as a result, I, so, I suppose this year's uh, report really is more comprehensive than ever. And it really does provide a clear picture of influence across Europe and those three largest economies in our market. Um, each year, the I always find the, the, the list and the ranking interesting because it, it really does not only tell us about who is influential, but also what it means to be an influencer in that particular year. Um, you know, we've witnessed some quite interesting shifts and changes and trends over the years. Um, and it's um, there's many different categories of technology that we, we monitor as well, which we'll touch on as we go. Um, just want to touch on briefly uh, about how exactly we create this ranking, because as you said, it is the sort of objective view, really. We find that most rankings um, that we see are very subjective. They're often based purely on a lot of um, simply social media sort of prowess, whereas we think about influence as a much more well-rounded um, idea. And therefore, our 500 ranking is determined by a, a combination of factors. Um, one is an individual social media clout. Um, the second uh, criteria is their online uh, personal and brand visibility and also their earned media presence. Now, obviously, just to mention that we, we do um, 
I include journalists in our list who tend to have quite a high online presence by the nature of their job. So we do rank them slightly differently and we take that into account, of course, um, as well. And we produce, as I say, this nice broad ranking, which includes 17 different tech sectors, uh, right from AI to travel and transport tech and also covers uh, eight categories of influencer as well, whether that's an academic, a business leader, um, a journalist, et cetera. So hopefully that gives you a bit of an overview. So this year we have three key themes which have emerged and between myself and my colleagues, Silke and Shamina, we're just going to take you through some of the key findings now. The first one I'm going to touch on is uh, the green tech boom. And um, it's fair to say that this has certainly shot up in the rankings based on, on last year. Uh, the number of green tech influencers has increased hugely significantly in each of the rankings, France, Germany, and the UK. As you can see, um, there's, well, there's 160% increase, would you believe, in, in green tech influencers in the UK this year. So you can see um, just how influential that sector has become. It's, the green tech is, is actually the fourth largest um, pool of people uh, within our fourth largest sector in our ranking um, behind, I think, the likes of fintech, consumer tech and general tech. So um, it's really a really, I was going to say niche area, but obviously it's a very specific niche area that's becoming um, absolutely core to, to what the world is considering. Um, and in terms of the type of people who feature in this list, we've got 59% um, of those from the business world, business leaders. We've got a fair number of academics as well. 15% of those green tech influencers are from academia and 13% are journalists. Um, a couple of key names just to call out um, from that green tech sector. The first is Alok Sharma. He is the president, of course, of, of COP26. COP26, the Global Climate Change Summit, which has just taken place in uh, Scotland uh, recently over here. So no surprises really to see him high up as a, as a green tech influencer. Caroline Lucas as well is, is a well-known name in the UK, at least. Um, she is an environmental activist and very uh, well-known in the political sphere for being the former leader of one of our political parties, the, the Green Party um, in England and Wales. And then also nice uh, for us in PR to see a journalist topping this, this list as well. Um, Simon Evans uh, falls in at number 29 in, in, the, in the ranking of, of green tech influencers. And he's the deputy editor of an influential publication in this space called Carbon Brief. I think now I'm just going to hand over to one of my colleagues to talk about the second uh, second key finding. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. <clears throat> so we saw um, a rise of influencers in the health tech and, and the biotech uh, space this year, which is probably not really surprising in the end. So they, they appeared last year in the report. Uh, they really increased. But this year, the trend was even more pronounced. Um, we saw in the biotech sector, we saw an increase of influencers in all the countries. And I think France um, is, is, really, uh, is really interesting here because the influencers in, that, uh, in France um, more than doubled. Uh, and it's pretty much similar in the health tech space where we saw a growth of 35% of influencers. And again, France um, is really noticeable because we came from zero influencer last year in this space to um, have uh, having 20 people this year. Um, the, 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 the overall in the, the pan-European picture is quite, it's quite similar. We saw, I think if we look at the top 500 uh, European influencers, we do have 47 uh, people that have belonged to this sector. And we have like, if we analyze the two categories, the growth, was uh, almost 48%. And we do have one in 10 influencer that belong to either the health tech or the biotech uh, sector. In terms of personalities, um, we see that in the biotech industry, people are really related to COVID-19. So for instance, uh, top ranking, in the top ranking, we have Kate Bingham, um, who is the chair of the UK government's vaccine task force. She was really key in the UK because she's the one who led the whole strategy around uh, procuring and deploying the vaccine uh, in the country. And she is followed by two leading figures um, in Germany, the two co-founders of 
the German company BioNTech, uh, which is also the you know creator of the Pfizer Pfizer vaccine. Um, in the in the health tech space, uh, the influencers that are the most um, present, I would say, are uh, people who are in the government uh, space. So, for instance, we have. Chris Whitty at the top of the ranking, who is the chief medical officer for England. And he had a really key role uh, in, in, in the UK, obviously in response, in response of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic. And he's followed by one of his closest collaborators, Patrick Valence, who's the chief scientific advisor to the UK government. And I think he had this role since 2018. So that really shows that um, Government members and academics um, are also really key um, in terms of influencers, and I think Silke, you can talk us through, you know, the most uh, relevant ones in the three countries. Yes, of course. Thanks, Shamina. Um, so yes, another major finding that we have seen uh, in our report is what we think also largely related to the pandemic, because of course in these times of well uncertainty, people are turning more to experts to learn more, get info, get guidance. So during the past year, we've seen that the role of members of governmental organizations, whether politicians or advisors, as well as of researchers and experts from academia has largely increased. So um, the first group, so the uh, politicians and advisors are obviously tasked with, you know, helping to digitize about a variety of sectors and the expertise of the latter group, the academia, is heavily needed for the categorization of the whole situation. So what we saw is that, um, influences from the academic sector have grown by 75% compared to the year before, and those from the governmental sector by 57%. Um, just, an, just an example, the German top 10, for example, of the report consists of eight politicians. Um, so that kind of shows you that the rise and, and, and um, the importance um, of, of this category of influences this year. Um, in addition, most of the top positions in the pan-European ranking are occupied by government or academic influencers. So 30% um, of the top 100 and even 52 of the top 25. So basically every second person or pe every second person in the top 25 pan-European belong to either one of those two groups. Um, and if you have a look at um, the specific people, you will have heard a few of the names. Um, already. So I think, Zoe, you mentioned Alok Sharma as the president of COP26. He's obviously um, in this list. Um, Chris Whitty as the chief medical officer for England, um, mm -hmm. really high up there as well. And Rishi Sunak as the UK chancellor of the Exchequer as well, um, is, is really high up the ranks um, in terms of the notable government um, personalities. And if we look at the academia, um, the leading person here is the French, uh, French astronaut, sorry, Thomas Pesquet, a European Space Agency astronaut. Um, Simon Evans has been in the green tech top list as well. So he's high up in the ranks of academic personalities as well, as well as Carol Sikora, founder and chief medical officer of Rutherford Health. And um, you've seen his name already in the um, biotech and health tech influencer list I mentioned by Shamina earlier. Well, um, thank you. Um, th those are really interesting kind of core themes, right, and findings. I noticed there are some additional findings in this report, um, notably about, about women in, in tech. Um, and I, I do think it's remarkable that all four of us happen to be women in tech uh, on this webinar. So could one of you um, speak to some of the additional findings? Um, I can certainly tell you a little bit more of the role of women in tech in, in our report. Um, and definitely, the, well, the four of us seem to be a minority because mm -hmm. similar to last year's report, actually, the 2021 edition of our title Tech 500 has also shown that women are very much underrepresented. Only mm -hmm. one in five of the pan-European top influencers are women, a little bit more, 22%. Um, the results have also shown that uh, France seems to be the least diverse country with the lowest percentage of women in tech, only 10% really, or 11%, sorry. Um, Germany is still below average, um, um, close to 19%. Um, the UK is a little bit above average with the highest proportion of women, but again, it's only um, approximately 24%, so still very much underrepresented, unfortunately. I think um, we do have a few more additional key findings. Zoe, so did you want to continue? Yes, absolutely. So 
I was, well, actually, yes, I was just going to go on to talk a little bit about, um, yeah, I think the, the, the interplay of journalists in our ranking is especially interesting this year. Um, we've really seen um, sort of a, a marked change, I suppose, in, you know, they're that now the second largest group in our ranking in the UK and Germany, which, of course, for us as PRs, is you know fantastic news and I think just serves to show you know for anyone listening to this um, webinar or podcast recording from outside of our region you know the influence and the role that these people play in our society I think so you can see they're the second largest group in UK and Germany a uh, third largest in France and the second most prevalent across the pan-European top 500 as a whole with almost 30 percent um, thirty percent of a of, of a chunk of our our overall ranking there. As you can see, there you know we're talking about journalists who cover a wide range of different topics, everything from fintech to green tech to a more general a more general uh, beat as well there. So that was certainly something we noticed. And the other thing um, that the report we always like to not just you know track influence about what's what's relevant to, to today, but we like to obviously keep an eye on the future as well as, as we are you know, a, a PR agency that focuses on the tech sector quite squarely. We're always looking at emerging techs and, and seeing what's, what's on the horizon um, in that respect. And um, what we found is that there are sort of three different um, uh, emerging techs that we think we should be keeping an eye on. So one of those is um, the logistics and manufacturing space. There's a lot of um, activity there in, in that sector, lots of uh, influencers joining our ranking this year in, in that area. And uh, space tech as well saw um, massive, massive growth and quantum as well, um, especially in the UK there, there's, there's, there's four, four influences in our top 500 in the UK. So just definitely something to keep an eye on for all of us, I think. Certainly something we're keeping an eye on here at Taito. And that's it. I think that's the overview we wanted to provide about the, the overall ranking for this year, Sabrina. Um, okay. Thank you for giving us the space to do that. Yes, well, absolutely. I mean, it, it really is very impressive. Um, so congratulations. And thank you for sharing uh, the findings with us. I think we'd like to now turn to the discussion part uh, of our webinar today. And I have a few questions. Um, let's start um, with Zoe first on the first question, um, and then we'll go to Silka and um, Shamina. So what should a U.S. communications person or marketer looking to bring their brand to Europe take from this year's ranking? I mean, mm -hmm. bottom line, what does this mean yeah. for the U.S. audience? That is the question, right? What does all this mean? There's a lot. Uh, there's a lot in it, isn't there? And there's a lot of ways I think we could we could take that and think about it. Um, I think first of all, breaking it down clearly, you know, especially around the rise of green tech, the rise of health tech and biotech. Clearly, right? It really reflects the world that we've all been living in for the last year or so. There is absolutely no getting away from that, um, and I think. In terms of what we can take, what a US, I suppose, comms or marketing person might want to take, take from this list, I think, first of all, thinking about it from their own seat in, in the US and thinking about it for that market. Actually, although we focus obviously on Europe, um, I think what we get into it is that some of the general trends we're seeing in our report this year could well be similar to trends you might find in the US, given the globalized nature of the world we're obviously living in. And obviously, if they're not exactly the same, you know, they might be slightly further ahead or behind. But I think there's a lot of similarities that we can expect there. Um, I think especially, obviously, like we've talked about, about the green tech, the influence of, of green tech on the social and media agenda and the impact that the health and biotech sectors are having in 2021. You know, I suppose that's definitely probably going to be extrapolable to, to the US market as well. Um, but a couple of things from, from the other perspective of, of a US audience thinking about, well, what does this mean to me? What does this mean in terms of operating in the European market? Well, I think the first thing is just to think about that the people in this list and the, the, the topics and the sectors that they cover, those are the 
those are the things that are driving the agenda in Europe. So if you're thinking about operating over here, then these are the things that, that you need to know about and recognize that are going on over here. And we're talking about, you know, these are kind of the, the trends and impacts that are, that are impacting the individual country and um, regional economies as well. So, you know, it's no small, uh, no small thing, you know, no small impact. But I think also thinking about it from a tech perspective, if, if you know, we're all, as you say, women in tech today, it's the sector we work in. I think what's also just interesting for me is that I think it's plain to see just how pivotal tech is becoming in addressing and solving some of the world's biggest challenges and issues. And that's really quite exciting. I think that's really, really evident from this year's list. Right. Very good. I'm sure my colleagues have got other thoughts and things as well. Yes. Silka, over to you. Just additional ones, Zoe. <laughs> um, I think while I completely agree with Zoe that um, the report definitely shows that the overall trends are quite global and there might, you know, one market might be a little bit behind, another one might be a little bit in front of the trend. But I think what the list also clearly shows us is that there is just no such thing as the European market, right? Yeah. Um, each market within Europe does have its own rules, own languages, own cultures, and also, as we see, own influencers. So I think this is really important to remember for any US brand, any brand really, um, when expanding into Europe. Um, so that is true for the UK, even though, you know, the language is shared, um, but it's even more true for other markets. So even within Europe, I think the Nordics cannot be considered to be just one market, nor can the dark region, so Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, even though those three markets kind of share the same language, it's still different markets, different cultures, different approaches. And I think that's really important to um, acknowledge, especially from a comms and marketing perspective when expanding a brand. Okay. Yeah, I completely agree with you, Silke. From, like, from a French perspective, uh, like language is so important. It's really key. And I do have a concrete example. So for instance, when we're asked to uh, distribute um, press release in English in um, either France or in Germany, almost uh, pretty much always we, we just against advice uh, uh, advice against this because this just um it's it's too it, it's too much work if we, if we expect the journalists to cover a story we cannot expect them to also translate translate mm -hmm. the story this is just you know they'll, they have no time uh, and on top of that if a brand or a business they really want to enter our market but they cannot be bothered to localize the content that they you know they, they want the audience to, to to read then it's they're putting themselves at risk of not being really serious on this market. So we have like a general rule where we say, if we are, if you're not, um, if you think it's not worth translating or localizing a press release, then it's probably not worth distributing it. Hmm. Interesting. Wow. Hmm. Very interesting and very helpful. Thank you. Um, so I, I have another question. Um, how does one actually get onto this list? <laughs> Million dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> the amount of times we, we do get asked that. It's funny that like the week that we, we issue we issue the ranking um, and we have you know our subsequent catch-ups with clients that week. It's funny how many of them say, so come on, you know, tell us how how, how can we get XYZ spokesperson onto this next year? Um, yeah, it's it's certainly certainly a good question for us. Funnily, funny, actually, because my immediate thinking on this plays back to what Shamina was just saying, which really comes back to relevance. You know, there's relevance in local market when we're dealing in Europe and making sure it really hits the spot. And I think, again, what this year's ranking has shown to me is um, there's the, just the clear link between influence and relevance, right? Because if you think about all the people who are ranked highly on this year's list, the reason you know they're ranked highly is because they're proving their relevance to the audience that they're communicating with. Um, you know they've been instrumental. Some of these people in navigating us through the pandemic, um, et cetera, et cetera. All these kind of global trends, and I just think you know it really highlights that the reason they're they're joining the list is because they're you know demonstrating how relevant they are. Um, so I think that's definitely something that we can all, all take heed of as, as PR and communication professionals, for sure. I also think that um, we certainly at Taito see influencers as quite a well-rounded concept. 
it's not just a you know it's not just about a social media following or a twitter following um churning out content to to get followers you know it's it's much more than that i think especially you know being influential in tech is is about having you know a, yes a profile on social media of course but it's also about that that media presence you can you can gain online um it's it's about a number a number of things really so yeah, I mean, we're happy to say actually that we do have a few clients on the list. Um, <laughs> one, one example actually I can draw on um, is uh, the CEO of a company called iProve, um, who are in the business of um, facial verification or facial biometric authentication. And their CEO, Andrew Budd, is somebody we've been working with for four or so years now. Um, and we've certainly um, taken the presence of, of, of iProve, you know, on a good few steps over, over the years we've been working with them um, and really, you know, helped grow their brand in the UK. And um, in doing so, um, Andrew Budd, the CEO's profile as well, and he does now feature in the list. Um, Silka, I think you were gonna, I think there's another of your clients on there as well, right? Mm. Um... Not, not technically, but um, a very good example is uh, Sarah Vieira from a company called Remote. Um, yeah. So she's an influential developer in Germany. And uh, as we mentioned before, one of the few women on the list, um, she's actually on um, rank 80 of the top 500 in Germany. And um, while Zoe just said it's not only about the social media following, um, for sure, but for her, really, it is one essential, one of the essential factors because she does have that huge following. So she she's written a book about coding, um, which has been um, all over the place. She's a blog, and she's also really active on LinkedIn. On Twitter, she has like thirty seven thousand followers. Um, she's on YouTube. She organizes meetups, and she is on conferences. So she's really all over the place. You can't really miss her within the developer scene. So that obviously helps her to be high up in in in, in this ranking. Um, but I think what we also can see generally when, when looking at the people on this list is um, it's really interesting to consider what they have in common. And um, what, what we found is that they all seem to be either educating, democratizing or sharing their knowledge. So and, and actually on however broad or niche a topic is. Um, and we think, well, some of them, you know, they have kind of the intrinsic motivation to do that. Um, but and I'm talking from more from a PR marketing perspective now, it's also possible kind of as a marketer to support your employees with becoming more influ influential. So if you're a marketer um, looking for someone to represent your brand and you know, be influential for your brand, um, you need to find such people um, within your organization and exactly those people who can either educate, democratize or share knowledge. Um, but what we also find is you know, these people are definitely out there but sometimes they just need a little bit of support, especially when it comes to resource. So um, as a marketer, really look within your organization, find these people and then see on however possible you can support them to become, um, you know, those even more visible influential people within, within the markets. Well, that's really excellent. Um, excellent practical advice. Um, thank you. Um, those examples were, are really helpful, I think. Um, <clears throat> um, next question. So, I mean, there's a lot of information in, in, this, in this report. Um, I'm curious, um, from the findings, what one aspect um, really caught your attention? And Shamina, I'll, I'll start with you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think one thing that caught my attention was that uh, we saw a few new sectors, like Zoe mentioned before, and space tech um, is one of them. And I guess I'm interested because uh, in the, in the <laughs> French uh, list of the top 500, the mm -hmm. first influencer is Thomas Pesquet. I think we mentioned his name. He's a French astronaut. Um, and he spent six months uh, in the space this year. He shared a lot of pictures, um, really incredible images like northern lines and just you know pictures, pictures of the of the planet, uh, and also more dramatic and worrying images such as you know wildfires or floods and impact really um, you know in different different places in the world. And he really contributed to democratize the subject. I want to say raise awareness, but also he led the conversation around uh, climate change. Right. And I think that was very interesting because we are all pretty much in lockdown or you know restricted in our own home and indoors and we couldn't really see the outside and him you know really showing the world what was what was happening what was going on really 
proved that you know people were keen to see and and interested and, and impacted. Um, so I thought that was very very interesting and relevant this year. Mm. Cool, um, Silke. Um, well, looking at this from with my with my German glasses on, mm -hmm. um, I found it really surprising that the overall number of influencers within the logistics and manufacturing is incredibly low. It's, except in France, in France it's quite high, but especially in Germany it's really low. And I found that surprising because especially the manufacturing is kind of the main industry driving our economy. So apparently um, people within this industry are not very outspoken just yet. On the contrary, though, if you look at the transport and travel tech, um, I think eight out of the pan-European top 10 are German. And it's largely the C-suite from the big car brands, which are kind of belong to the manufacturing, but are, you know, mm. in, the, in their own sector as well. So those are really outspoken and really out there. And that is, is really a, somehow contrary, um, which I found really surprising and interesting to see. Mm. Cool. And Zoe? Yeah, um, I mean, I think for me, so I'm um, Taito's head of media and influence. So obviously my role at Taito um, involves not only sort of advising clients on media strategies and, and that kind of thing, but it's looking at the innovation side of things as well and how we can um, engage with journalists as PR people and, you know, really sort of um, support them and, and contribute something well to, to the world around us and to what they're doing. And I think what was just so pleasing to see from my perspective was the predominance of journalists within the list this year, um, because I think we're definitely at a really interesting time where the media landscape has certainly changed quite a lot and, and the way we work as PRs with journalists is changing quite rapidly based on all the different effects and impacts we've seen over the last sort of year or two with COVID as well, you know. The, you know, the, the media industry in, in the UK, especially, I know, has been under considerable pressure of late. And, um, you know, for that reason, it's just great to see that the influence is still there um, for, for journalists. And I think, you know, that kind of interplay that there's, a, there's a, been a lot more money floating around in tech recently as well, right, in the form of investment. And one of the things we're finding is that, you know, where there's been, say, an absence of, say, big ticket marketing activity and events work in the last sort of year or two as well because of COVID, that that money tends to filter through into PR. But at the same time, you've got this kind of um, difficult situation with the media industry being quite under pressure. And that's driving just quite a lot of change in terms of how PR and, and journalists are having to work together in the UK. And I know similar in, in France and Germany and as Europe as a whole. So um, again, there's just a lot for us to think about there um, for PR people, as PR people in, in our markets. And, and yeah, I think it's exciting as well to see that, that those media really are still, still key. Um, and it gives us a lot of, a lot of um, you know, great platform to, to go into 2022 on, I think. Right. Well, I mean, that's a great, uh, that's a great summary. Um, you know, I, I really have to say congratulations. This report is, uh, offers really valuable information um, in general to, to anyone wanting to market in the UK, France and Germany, especially for, for US-based companies during this rather challenging time. Um, so um, I'd like to say thank you very much to the three of you, Zoe, Zilka, and, and Shamina. Um, that's it really for today's Taito Tech 500 discussion. If any of you would like to find out more about Taito's research, you can visit the Taito website and browse their top 100 rankings, whether you're interested in the UK, France, or Germany, and download the report. Taito would love to hear your comments, and I'm sure these fabulous women would love to help you understand the European tech market. You can share your thoughts via the Taito Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram channels, or in the comments of the YouTube version of this discussion. And lastly, if you want to keep track of Taito's new episodes and the exciting views on tech, make sure you subscribe to their podcast called Without Borders. That's it, everybody. Thank you again for listening.